Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. And last week, as we've been making our way uh, through the book of Matthew, and we began the Sermon on the Mount uh, several weeks ago, um, and then last week we talked about salt and light, Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 15. And I said, this is going to kind of be a two-week part talking about salt and light. Uh, Last week, we talked specifically about what does that mean that we, when Jesus says, you are salt and light, that he is saying you individually, as you exist as disciples of Christ, as followers of Christ, what does that mean for you both individually, but then coming together corporately, being salt and light in this world together? And I said that this week would be more about application. Uh, What does that mean for us this year? And something else that has kind of come to our attention, um, we know that in the last year and a half, maybe you noticed there's a pandemic happening. And throughout the pandemic, we've actually had to say um, goodbye to some very dear families, people in the military that uh, got stationed elsewhere, friends that have moved, and that's kind of been the uh, course over the last, since our existence has happened, is the amount of times we have to put our arms around people and say goodbye to them as they move to whatever country or state that they've been called to next. But in those continuing conversations, we've realized that uh, several of them came to know the Lord here. Um, that it was here that they made Jesus the forgiver of their sins and the leader of their life, and they've never really looked for a church before. And a lot of them are still continuing to watch our services online, and we're excited about that. But every one of them I've talked to says, okay, but you also have to find a local body of believers to be part of where you are at. And so part of this message is we know not all of you are going to be here the rest of your lives, unfortunately. But that is exciting because that means God is going to use you elsewhere. And so how are we best equipping you to know the the biblical terminology or what it means to be part of a biblical church? But secondly, a couple, I guess it was two months ago, I asked the question when at that time we were moving back inside, how many of you have never attended a church service at Hope Church indoors? And about half the parking lot's hands went up. And so I was like, oh, that's a lot of new people. So thank you. But also, this would be a good time to say when, when Jesus is explaining here on the Sermon on the Mount to these people, and he's introducing these bizarre concepts at the time, what does that mean for us, and how does that play out? And so I'm going to be talking about our mission and vision of Hope Church, but I want you to know right up front uh, I do not like using blanket statements that I, we are, and I'm going to get into this in a minute, but that we are part of the kingdom of God, meaning we, uh, one of our desires and one of our values is that we work hand in hand with other gospel-believing churches in the area. Uh, it's the reason we meet on Saturday night, and I kind of explain Hope Church this way. Um, if all the churches are this beautiful tile in this mosaic, we kind of think of ourselves as the grout. Like we are just trying to, what are the areas that all the churches who are working together in the area are hitting and what's being left in the cracks that we can reach out? And Saturday nights is one of those areas for people that work on Sunday mornings. And so that's kind of how we view ourselves uh, is just how do we work hand in hand with other churches to provide another option? Uh, We in no way think we have it figured out. We in no way think we're the only church that got it. Uh, We just view ourselves as part of the bigger body of Christ, as trying to follow what the Spirit is calling us to do to reach every man, woman, and child in the area. So with that being said, those are my disclaimers. I'm sorry if I say a lot of churches. It's actually one of my pet peeves. If I don't think anyone here has been in a meeting with me where they say, well, you know, Rob, a lot of people. I will immediately pull out a notepad that at the top says a lot of people with the number one, and I say, give me a name. Let's go through these a lot of people, and I've yet to write down one single name on that list. So, uh, so I, I don't like using that terminology, but it's been very apparent over the last year and a half 
that just possibly we as specifically Americans or Western churches may have a skewed view of what church is. Uh, that we may have lost reality and we're basing things more on what we're used to than what a biblical church, how a biblical church actually functions. And so I want to start off going back to Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13. It was kind of funny last week, I was talking about salt and light and how are we the light of the world and realized I have to get a lamp for this table because I cannot see my Bible. So I have my lamp. So join with me, Matthew 5, starting in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So what does this mean both for us personally and corporately as we do these things in our personal lives, in our everyday lives, what does that mean as we come together as a body of believers representing Jesus in our worlds? And it's kind of a overall statement. I was brought up in church. Most of you know my father was a pastor. I well, worked at different Bible colleges, and I would sit in these classes, and I would always hear them say, uh, when we would turn to 1st or 2nd Corinthians, they would refer to it as the worst church ever. Oh, the Corinthian church, they had it. So they had all these messed up people. The more I've been involved in church, and especially church planning here, I've realized, I think the Corinthian church got it. I think they were doing it right. Why? Because they were welcoming in people who were really messed up and didn't know that they should hide it that they were a welcoming church. Now, every single one of us comes to church every week not realizing that we bring tons of baggage with us. We are coming from different backgrounds. Uh, I was trying to think of all the different, just the nations that we have represented here and the background of denominations and you name it. All of us come with a background here on Saturday night or wherever we gather for church and we bring with us stuff from our past. We bring with us shame and, and guilt, and we bring with us maybe sin that we've learned to cover up or things that we don't even know are sin that are existing in our lives, and we come together because something is bringing us together. It's the Holy Spirit. Spoiler alert. And it's bringing us together, and now we get to be together as a family. And that's what we see in Corinth. You have people that are worshiping all sorts of different temples and different gods, and they're coming to church, and they're like, wow, these people are amazing. But you know what I really like to do over at that temple? Can we do that here? And some people are like, no, we could never. Well, that does sound interesting. We'll give it a whirl. And they're like, you know what would make communion better? And as you go through all of these different things that, Paul is correcting, we understand that it was just messed up people coming together and they were growing in their faith. Paul is instructing them how to live. Henry Ward Beecher, who was a pastor in the 1800s, he said, the church is not a gallery for the exhibition of eminent Christians, but a school for the education of imperfect ones. And so the body of believers comes together as imperfect to learn how to grow together. And so now, if you're taking notes, point number one, God's strategy from the beginning. We are going to do an entire survey of God's people starting at creation. This will not be an exhaustive <laughs> listing. And in fact, I'm going to start my timer now, meaning that all doesn't count. Now, God's strategy from the beginning, and 
we actually have talked about, do we do it frequently asked questions? This is in no way going to be exhaustive, but this is something I absolutely love. If you've spent any amount of time here, I love the history and I love the, the cultural context and I love all this stuff, but I'm going to move through this really quick, but please, I would love to talk about this in depth with anyone. And if enough people get together, we'll get together together and do question and answer, whatever. I love discussing this stuff. But for the sake of time, I only have two hours. We are just going to get through it as fast as we can. Just kidding. There will be a mutiny of the children's workers if I go that long. So God's strategy from the beginning. And I want, kind of as an umbrella thing that we're going to see, is God's people, the reason from creation to exist was to glorify God to gather to worship and learn about him and to demonstrate his characteristics to those around them. And we see this right at creation, the creation of Adam and Eve, that they were designed to praise God and steward his creation. They were designed to show just how powerful a God that we serve, all-knowing, all-powerful. And then sin, very early on, created problems. And that is something we are going to see is sin creates problems, but God always provides a solution. There will always be sin, and sin will always in some way be used by Satan to try to get people to not worship God, to not glorify God, to bring into existence all sorts of ways to argue and to separate and to split and have disunity of brothers and sisters in this human world, but God always provides a solution. So sin created problems, God provides a solution right from the beginning in Genesis. And as we move through quickly, we get to Abraham, and God selects, he chooses Abraham to be the father of a nation. There's a lot to learn here, and again, I wish we had time. But one thing we see with Abraham is he says, look at the stars, Your offspring are going to be larger than all the stars. Look at the sand. Your offspring are going to be larger than the sand. So we're going to start with one. You're going to have one child when you're really old. And right away we see this patient program that God's timing is different than our timing right from the beginning but that these people were selected by God to represent God, to, number one, glorify God, to worship or serve him, and then to demonstrate the characteristics of God around them. Fast forward even further, and we get to Moses. And Moses, again, is one of these what I call the imperfect saviors. They rescued people, but they were messed up. They were not the perfect, long-awaited savior. They were imperfect saviors. And he leads God's people and he tries to get them to understand, no, you are God's people. Stop worshiping idols. Stop complaining. As God's people, we are to glorify God, worship and serve him and him alone, and to represent him and his characteristics to the world around us. And we continue down the line. We come to David. I'm sorry, in Abraham, we see the um, building of the tabernacle which is just this beautiful tent-type structure, very detailed, and that is where the presence of God would dwell, and that is where the worship of God would take place. That is where they would bring their sacrifices to the altar to represent the temple that would come. By the way, this is now the offering tabernacle, and this is now the coffee tabernacle. But they would close it down as they continued to move. And for years and years and years, this was the place that they would go and worship God. And although they had this representation of a place of worship of God, they continued to worship idols. And then we come to David and this establishment of Jerusalem and the temple would be built. But because of choices that David made, God will not let him build the temple. And it crushes David. And David doesn't get pouty and sad and say, well, I give up. He says, you know what I'm going to do then? I'm going to save as much money to build the most beautiful temple ever. We see David called a man after God's own heart. And then his son Solomon builds this unbelievable temple to be a place where the presence of God existed 
where people came to glorify God, to worship and serve him. And they were supposed to represent his characteristics to the world around them. But over and over again, they chose idols. They forgot God. It was just something they did when it was convenient. And then we get into this weird period called the exilic period. Now, last year we went through Ezra and Nehemiah, and we talked about this at length, and we talked about how they would came to rebuild the temple after the Babylonians brought them into captivity and the Assyrians, and then they ended up uh, Cyrus, um, who was with the Persians, came into power, and he was very friendly to the Jewish nation. He said, go back and build your temple. And they said, okay, let's go. We finally get to go build our temple. And everyone said, nah, we're good. We're going to stay here because we have these things called synagogues. Now, so little is known about the synagogues, although they're mentioned quite a bit, especially in the New Testament, but they began, they believe, in this exilic period where they were in captivity, and because the um, Persians were friendly with the Jews and allowed them to worship, they would build these synagogues to be a representation of where they could gather together, hear God's word, hear the law read, and most of the synagogues, that was it. Gentiles weren't allowed in. They wouldn't allow you in if you didn't believe like them. There was a separation in all sorts of different dynamics, men and women and all of these other things. And again, some of this is very hard to gather together because the history is so minimal on it. And then they started to build the temple and it just wasn't going as planned. And again, you can go back and listen to Ezra and Nehemiah and find out all about that. And then we fast forward into just before Jesus comes to earth. And during this exilic period, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes and the Zealots, all of them are into an existence. And now they've gone through so much turmoil over different world leaders in this over 400 years. And now the Romans are in charge and they hate the Romans. And then we get to Jesus in uh, John chapter 2 and he is getting ready to lay the smack down in the temple. And he's making whips and he's getting ready to go in. And the reason being is because they had set up all of these tables for basically money exchange and selling and telling people, oh, your animals just aren't good enough for sacrifice. Luckily, I've got my own. And they found ways to make money, but they set it up in the Gentile court. The place where the Gentiles could come in and watch God's people worship him and be in awe of what it is to worship an all-powerful God and to see the existence and the power and the authority of this all-knowing, real, true God, the King of Kings. And instead, they had set it up with conveniences for the already saved. It was a place where they were making money off of stuff and they were lying and they were cheating people out of it rather than a place where the unbelievers could come in to see the worshipers of God worship God and be awed by him, it was a place of convenience. It was a place of thievery. It was a place that they were mocking. And Jesus comes in and says, this is my father's house. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. And look what you've done. And then we get into the book of Acts. And Acts is where we see this church form. The big picture of all of these places of worship was a place where followers of God gathered to worship and serve. Remember, worship and serve are interchangeable. They gathered to worship and serve him, to bring him glory, and to practice the characteristics of God to the surrounding world. And as we get into Acts, we now start to see this take place. It was no longer a group of people who were all about themselves and how much money can I make and how popular can I become and what can I do to promote myself. At the end of Acts chapter 4, they are sharing all things. They are taking care of each other. Nobody was in need. People were saying, I've got extra stuff. I'm going to sell it and give it so that we can all live in harmony. And it was a demonstration to the world around them of how they were supposed to have been living all, around, all the time that they were supposed to be living in a way that as they displayed the characteristics of God, the outside world said, I must have that. Only an all-powerful God could use human beings to display his glory. And that's what we see the church doing. But they still huddled together in Jerusalem. Then Stephen comes along, and they stone Stephen, and then the persecution starts. Then they go out, and they are 
church planting like crazy all over the world. In fact, Paul keeps going to places, and Silas and Barnabas, and they're going to different places. They're going, i got to start a church there. And they get there, and they're like, wow, there's already a great one happening here. Nobody even knows who started it. So this persecution led, and then Acts chapter 9 and 10, where we see uh, Peter have the vision, and he goes to Cornelius' house, and now they're saying, no, this is open for everyone. This was my plan all along. In fact, I was reading in uh, Luke last week, and it says, uh, after Jesus is resurrected, and he's walking with these people, and he explains everything to them. It's like, man, how awesome would it have been to be in that conversation? They didn't recognize Jesus, and he's going through all of the prophets, explaining, no, this is why I'm going to the Gentiles. This is why this is happening. This is why this is happening. I wish that was recorded, because I could have just read it instead of trying to go through this quickly. But he's showing them this was the plan all along. And something that we may have gotten away from is the church is displayed in unity, not uniformity. And that's what we see in so many of these churches. You see, uniformity is really what we crave. As, as our, most of us, our sinful desire is uniformity, meaning I want to go to a church where we all believe the same, think the same. We don't have to argue about anything. Uh, we all do the same thing with our kids for schooling. Uh, we all vote the same way. We all, do, we all look the same way. We all have the same past, and we all want the same future, and we come together, and now we've got unity because we all think the same. That's uniformity. That is not unity. Unity is when different people from different nations, from different cultures, and they come together from different past belief systems or no belief systems, and uh, some homeschool their kids, and some put their kids in public school, and, and some do private school, and it's okay, and some vote this party, and some vote that party, and you know what? It's okay because we're serving a bigger purpose, and we all come together with these different pasts, and we come together because we can re- we unite over the blood of Christ and what that means to us. That is unity. And that's what we strive for. And I don't mean we as Hope Church, I mean we as Christ followers should strive for this unity and not uniformity because that is one of the ways that we demonstrate a characteristic of God, that all nations coming together in different languages praising him. And again, as we've been saying as we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount, this wasn't for some special force type of Christian. This way of living was to be the case for everyone who called themselves a follower of Jesus. And so what does this mean for us today? What does this mean for us as God's people in general, no matter where we are at? And what does this mean for us as God's church? Remember, the church is referred to as two things. One, it is referred to as the bride of Christ. And I've got to tell you, the last couple of years, I've started to understand the seriousness of this. A lot of times when we're looking at marriage passages in the Bible, like Ephesians 5, we're like, wow, that's about marriage. And I have to remind, no, that's about the church. It's what marriages can learn from the church. But first and foremost, it's about the church and its relationship with Jesus. And we see all the things that Jesus does for his bride that he lived for his bride, that he died a horrible death for his bride, that he was the redeemer of his bride, that he has called his bride, that he loves his bride, that he protects his bride. A couple years ago, I started realizing that a lot of the jokes I made, I don't think Jesus found them funny. A lot of the ways that I would personally make fun of the bride of Christ, if somebody did that to my wife, we would have some serious issues. That the way that people are making money off of, making fun of the bride of Christ in public platforms or private platforms should crush us. And I'd love to tell you that I've done it. I no longer make jokes about it. But it's something that's just been hitting me very hard over the last couple of years. The church is the bride of Christ. And he loves his bride. And his bride has some serious imperfections. I know because I know myself. But he still loves us. He loves his bride enough that we are also called the body of Christ. He loves us enough that he is giving us talents and abilities and and giftings when we come to know him that we get to use to represent him. In the passage we always go to in 2 Corinthians saying, God says, no, I am so powerful that I can use you. 
And that's how I demonstrate my power because people know you and they know what a mess up you are. But I have this perfect plan for you and I've gifted you and given you talent and ability so that you can represent my characteristics so that people come to know me. So as God's church, we're the bride of Christ. We're the body of Christ. And then to get specific for Hope Church, what does that mean for us? So Hope Church's vision is quite simple. If you go on our website, or hopefully most of you can repeat this, Hope Church exists to glorify God, build his kingdom, and fulfill the Great Commission. It sounds really vague. I've been told by business leaders, okay, you've got to be way more specific. And I think about it, I'm like, I think that's what God told us to do. So we're just going to keep it. And the, to me, the part that's so important is the word exists. Hope Church exists. Because if we're glorifying God and we're building his kingdom and we're fulfilling the Great Commission, we are existing as a church. The moment one of those things cease, we cease to be a church and we start to be a social club. We start to be a place that we come to network at. We start to be just a fun place. And we are no longer a church. Yeah, we get together. But if we're not doing those three things that we are commanded to do, we no longer are a church. And we have to take that out of our name. So what are those three things? Number one, glorify God. This is the chief responsibility of mankind. It is why we were created. Understand, God is glorified in everything. That's just something about his power. But when we look back just at this passage we read, and again, we could go through tons of passages on this, but it says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You doing good deeds, you bearing fruit is never about you. It is never about the, the name on the sign out front. It is always about God. The moment that we do things trying to make ourselves look awesome, we fail to make God look awesome and we failed in why we were created in the first place. The moment that we start to promote the, the sign and the name up front, more than we promote Christ and knowing him, we are not fulfilling the function of why we are put on earth. So we glorify God first and foremost. Secondly, we build his kingdom. Understand Jesus talks about his kingdom when he's on earth more than anything else. He talks about his upside down kingdom that it does not function as the way the world functions. And he's calling us to live this out, to be focused on his kingdom. What that means, again, is that we're not focused on our church. We're focused on the bigger, uh, big C church of what we call the Church of Charleston or the universal church of the world. And we have several churches that we partner with. If, if you're here and for whatever reason you're trying to find another church, I always want to help you find a, a best fit for you. But also understand that in the majority of the world, you don't get that option. Majority of the world, it's wherever you and one other person can meet without raising suspicion. It's where you and just maybe three people can meet. And there's no guitars and there's no speakers and there's no advertising because that will bring with it a prison sentence. That will bring with it possible death. So these are just luxuries that we get to have. So how are we using that to build his kingdom? How are we partnering? Because we aren't going to reach Somerville, let alone the greater Charleston area. So how do we partner with other churches, come alongside of them? It is not about our name. It is about promoting God to our community. Because I believe I heard this week, and again, I'm not a professional at numbers or statistics, but I believe 44 people are moving to the greater Charleston area every day. Neil McGlowan, as he would do his Cypress Project, would always say, we need a new church to start every single week until the end of the year. And then we need all of those churches to be at 300 people, including the one that starts that last week of the year. And if we can get all those churches to be planted and all of them to be at 300 people by the end of the year, we wouldn't have even reached the people that moved here during that time. So we can't do it by ourselves. We have to do it as a unified kingdom of God working together to build his kingdom. And then third is to fulfill the Great Commission. Again, we just preached on this a couple weeks ago at the end of our discipleship series we did this summer. Fulfill the Great Commission to go and make disciples. That's the command, not a, if you, got a, if you get a chance, try. It's a command of God, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
and teaching them everything that I have taught you. And yes, it's going to take a lifetime. But we go. We make disciples. So that's our vision. And our mission, love, equip, send. Love, equip, send. Again, pretty simple. Hopefully it's memorable. If not, just look around because there's a bunch of t-shirts out there with them on. We love. We love two things. That's it. God and others. In Matthew 22, verse 34, the Pharisee said, what's the greatest command? He said, oh, that's simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second's like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And your neighbor is the world. Even the people you don't like, even the people who annoy you, frustrate you, have fired you, you love them. In 1 John, it says, how can we say we love God and hate our brother? If anyone does that, they're a liar. So we love the people that we've been commanded to love because that is the best way that we demonstrate our love for God. We love God, we love him first and foremost with every part of who we are. And we love others, not just who we want, but who God wants, our neighbors, which equals everyone. Secondly, equip. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. It says, it is getting dark. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how f- from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We spend the rest of our lives becoming equipped. And Hebrews 13, 20 through 21 And again, I would love to just spend a lot more time on all these passages, so let me know when you want to get coffee. It says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So we equip the saints for every good work. It's why we do our Bible studies. It's why we do our community groups. By the way, they're starting up this week. Uh, Women's starts Monday night. Uh, Talk to uh, Tab or Liz or Sarah if you have any questions about those. We have, I think, two or three uh, men's groups on Tuesday and Wednesday night. And then we have two early in the morning, 6 a.m. here on Wednesday, uh, 5 a.m. on Thursday morning. Uh, Cam, we're just going to do that here. All right, that's here. I've been saying TBD. It's now been determined. It'll be here 5 o'clock Thursday mornings as well. Bring a lawn chair. We meet underneath this covered area out here. But we equip the saints for every good work. And that really sums up in two things, giving and building up. We give our time, we give our abilities, and we give of our resources to equip the church. Not just our church, but churches around the world, other churches in the area. We use our talents and our gifts to come alongside other churches. And we have been so blessed by other churches coming alongside of us. And then we build up. We build up the body of believers by discovering and practicing our gifting and encouraging others to do the same. From a heart overflowing with gratitude, we will want to honor and glorify God by gratefully offering back to him the many good gifts he has bestowed on us. We will not go to church to be entertained, to see what we can get out of it for our own private gratification, but rather to praise and worship the triune God of grace and glory. Nobody knows who actually said that quote, so it's mine. I'll say it again. From a heart overflowing with gratitude, as we've been talking about uh, the, the Beatitudes, those who are poor in spirit, those that are humble, those that are realizing that without God they are spiritually bankrupt, those that humble themselves, those that operate out of meekness, those that, as we went through those, and again, listen to them in past weeks, but as we do that from a heart overflowing with gratitude, we will want to honor and glorify God by gratefully offering back to him the many good gifts he has bestowed on us. We will not go to church to be entertained, to see what we can get out of it for our own private gratification, but rather to praise and worship the triune God of grace and glory. And then the third word is send. 
Oswald Smith in the early 1900s says, the mission of the church is missions. And we think if you're like me, missions is something that you pay somebody else to go do in another world. Missions is something that you get a prayer card, you throw it up on your fridge and you pray for them as they go somewhere else. But missions is is truthfully giving every man, woman, and child multiple opportunities to see, hear, and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ where you live, learn, work, and play. The mission of you is missions in those areas. The mission of me is missions in those areas. So when we send, understand that means that when you are sent after the closing prayer here, you are now in the mission field. A lot of times it's before you pull out of the parking lot. You are sent into your homes, into your neighborhoods, your workplaces, your schools, your leagues, your cities, your states, the countries, and the world every week. So I've started saying at the end of church, okay, you are dismissed to go be the church. We come together here to celebrate God, to worship him, to learn about him, to demonstrate his glory to those that don't know him yet who are here, offering them the opportunity to make Jesus the forgiver of their sin and the leader of their lives, but then we leave to go be the church through the week. Jay Delaney says, a church that is busy ministering to itself, building itself up, edifying itself, and reaches no farther than its own four walls is self-centered. Training, edification, and equipping of the saints is not an end itself, but is a means to an end. God's goal is that the church be built up so that it can effectively function in the world and carry out Christ's will on earth. I invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Again, this, I've preached on this before in the past. I know these are just summaries. It kills me not to go into long and in depth talking about them. The Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19, says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with a full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. That last part, I want you to know, I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but I know we're now closer. And that's how it will be tomorrow. This is the, if I could summarize it real quickly, I love this passage. Because it is so important that we are together. And maybe because of the world that we exist in and the the freedoms that we have, we may not fully understand all that we have in Christ and how much we desperately need each other. But I know at times where Tab and I have been hurting or have gone through different tragedies, we have needed you. And we know that at different times, we get to be there for you. And when I say we, I mean Hope Church, not just Tab and myself but that we need each other. We need to be involved in each other's lives. It's how we grow. When we bring differences, when we learn from each other, when we build each other up, when we go arm in arm through life together, it's how we grow. So do not get in the habit of not meeting together. It is so important. Augustine in the 300s, one of the early church fathers, wrote this, and I love his summary of what a church should be. The disturbers are to be rebuked, the low-spirited to be encouraged, the infirm to be supported, objectors confuted, the treacherous guarded against, the unskilled taught, the lazy aroused, the contentious restrained, the haughty repressed, the poor relieved, the oppressed liberated, the good approved, the evil born with, and all are to be loved." 
And fast forward to just a couple years ago, J.D. Greer said we should not allow people to see the church as a weekly service they attend to make God happy. The gathering of the church is preparation for heavenly battle. We huddle together for a few minutes each week to worship God together and build each other up so that each of us can more effectively run the missional play throughout the week. And it can be difficult. The other part I love in Hebrews is when it says, spur one another on. When I was younger and I would see cowboys, which I was always fascinated with, wearing their spurs, and I said, Mommy, what are those? And they said, they use those to tickle the horse to get it to go. Then I started riding horses. And then I learned there's no tickling involved. And especially in the Roman time period, their spurs were actually just looked like a nail coming out of the back. And they would jab the horse in the sides with that to get it to enter into battle. Because a horse naturally doesn't want to run into battle. And a horse doesn't naturally want to walk through water because horses can't see how deep it is. And there's a lot of things that horses naturally don't want to do. And so you use those spurs to help the horse, one, gain trust with the rider, and two, to obey. So there's going to be times of spurring one another on in love. And that happens when we gather together. It happens when we invest in each other's lives. It happens when we come together, and although we might have different thoughts on stuff, we can come together as one because of the unity that only comes through Jesus Christ, that only comes through his blood. And so this evening, two things. One, if you are here and you have never accepted Christ as your Savior, if you have never talked to God, if you have never called out and, and confessed your sins to him and know that you need him as the only forgiver of your sins to come and forgive you and to become the leader of your life, we ask and our prayer is, like everything that we do is for the reason of wanting people to know God. Wanting people to understand what it is to be forgiven and experience the, the freedom from the guilt and the shame. Freedom from all the things that the world has hanging over your head or the things that you battle with. We want you to know Christ. But then for those who are here that have already made that decision to follow Christ, that have made Jesus the forgiver of your sins and the leader of your life, how are you living these things out? Because again, we can make vision and mission statements and values and we can do all sorts of pretty stuff. But until each of us has the mindset of glorifying God in our personal lives, till each of us has a mindset that we are here to build his kingdom, till each of us has a mindset that we individually have to fulfill the great commission, are we really truly living out what God's called us to do? What are the priorities like in, in our lives? Are we trying to make ourselves look awesome or are we trying to make God look awesome? Because we cannot do both at the same time. So this is a difficult message because it's very open-ended. And my next steps would be, are you getting involved in a Bible study, in a community group? Are you getting involved, uh, for those that are watching this recording, are you getting involved in a local body of believers? We really appreciate you watching us and listening to us on the podcast, but how are you doing where you are at? I want to know how we can answer questions. Like I said, my favorite thing to do is to get coffee or whatever and sit down with people and have these conversations. I view the message as just the beginning. In fact, during our community groups and Bible studies, we're going to be kind of walking through and talking through a lot of these um, conversations from the messages as we continue to work our way through the Sermon on the Mount for the next seven or eight years. That was a joke. That's why Liz left. It's going to be more like 12. We want to have these conversations. Please come talk to us. We want to be there for you. We want to reach this community together, but we need each other. So please come talk to us. Like I said, this is a very open-ended closing, but we want to have these conversations. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to come together as your people. Lord, I thank you for the freedom that we have to be able to use all of the different things that we have, the microphones and speakers and signs and 
different ways of letting people know that we're here for them. Lord, I thank you that we can freely live out your characteristics, that we can do things like the, the grocery giveaway and that we can do things like helping people who are hungry and helping the single parents and just whatever it is that you've called us to do. Lord, I thank you that we can have the freedom to talk about it openly without worrying about repercussions. But Lord, we know we can do more. Lord, I pray that we would come together as a people who are focused on glorifying you, building your kingdom, and fulfilling the Great Commission. Because we know it doesn't matter the name on the building or the parking lot that we enter into, that we are called to do those things as your followers. And Lord, I pray for anyone here this evening who has never made that decision to follow you. Lord, I pray that you would be working in their heart right now. That you would remove the blinders that Satan has blinded them with so that they can call out to you. Lord, I pray that you would give them the courage. I, I know it's difficult going up and talking to someone and asking questions. But Lord, I pray that you would give them the courage to come up and just ask one of us, talk to one of us, sort stuff out. And Lord, we do all of these things for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.